Hi, I'm Kendra Winchester and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be doing the second half of my March wrap-up, which is three books because I had a rough second half of March reading-wise, so yeah, but they were really long books, I think, or they were trying to be long in some cases. Anyway, I'm just going to give myself the benefit of the doubt. We're going to start with a fantastic book, which is The Lonely Hearts Hotel by Heather O'Neill, and this is out from Riverhead. And uh, the design, of course, is amazing because they're Riverhead. Yeah, never doubt Riverhead's design chops. Uh, the Lonely Hearts Hotel is about Rose and Perot. They grow up of, as orphans in this um, orphanage in Montreal during the Great Depression, and they fall in love and are separated. So the entire book, I guess, oversimplified, is them trying to find each other. So I'm going to try to do this without any spoilers because this book is so magical. Like I don't think any real magic per se happens in this book, but there's definitely a lot of magical feel, like really subtle magical realism. And somehow with her style and her storytelling and her structure, she really invokes the fairy tale ask feel and so if you love fairy tales you will definitely love this book because it just it just feels magical like some stuff happens and it's over at the top but you believe it because heather o'neill is that good i will say just fair warning there are a lot of trigger warnings in this book so just be prepared as you you know meander through it that stuff happens but it is quite good just yeah i really love this book and I can't wait to talk to her uh, later this month for the Reading Room podcast so that will be fun and I can talk to her about all of her hotels which she named after love symbols and stuff which is cool. Next up is uh, The Sword of Kings by C.E. Morgan and this is definitely like you almost have to hold this thing with two hands as like I'm trying to show it to you uh, because it's definitely a chunkster. It's not exactly Versailles Shakespeare but it's trying to be maybe that's what it wants to be when it grows up but this is a, a book that was shortlisted for the uh, Bailey's Prize which was announced that was announced yesterday which is really exciting this book is really just amazing there's so much going on in this book and I feel like I'll only be like talking about the tip of the iceberg with just how many layers of meaning are in this book yeah, there's no way to describe it, so I'm just going to go for it and just watch a bunch of videos about this book and maybe that way it'll give you a more well-rounded feel. Um, this book, yeah, it is intimidating, but it's split into six sections, like six acts or um, novelettes or something, and it just moves through time that way. And uh, there's interludes that sometimes connect back to other interludes, but you can tell where she was going with the theme. And so this book is about the Forge family uh, who live in, I think, around Paris, Kentucky. And you can see this um, map that they conveniently put on there. My parents live um, in northern Kentucky, and so I sent her a picture of the end papers. And I was like, Mom, look, they included a map because, you know, Kentucky, northern Kentucky is the middle of nowhere. It's like this magical land, like Middle Earth. And she just died because, yeah, it does need a map middle of nowhere but this is a proper like southern family plantation family they have like the Tennessee Walkers and everything and Henry is born and his dad is basically a jerk and so because Henry wants to turn the entire plantation into a horse farm and his dad's like no and whatever so eventually when his dad dies Henry does turn it into a horse farm and he's looking for the perfect horse which he believes can happen and so there's a lot about breeding theory and just horses in general which is really fascinating I used to work with foals and yearlings so I really loved seeing like you know all the descriptions of training and foals and just how that worked which was really interesting and there's also Henrietta who is Henry's daughter narcissistic much I think so naming your daughter the feminine version of your own name yeah, she works with her dad as like the farm manager and then there's also Almond who is a groom. And one of the sections is about Almond's childhood and that is set in Cincinnati. And Almond is a half white, half black kid growing up um, with a single mom because his dad like left and started a new family because he's a jerk. And I really loved how the parallels of the two families and the way Henry, Henry and Harry, Henrietta <laughs> That is really hard to say. Henry and Henrietta both grew up in like the lap of luxury and heritage and then 
Almond didn't even know his heritage because his dad ran off and he just didn't know much about it. And so it really has the parallel families and what does it mean to know your heritage and what is heritage. And there's a lot of like um, play on evolutionary theory themes and things like that. And are, yeah, there's, there's just so much in this book. <laughs> The one critique I would have about it is that she does have like speeches in the book that reinforce her theme when it talks about racism and different things and I felt that her writing and storytelling were already so good she didn't really need those to reinforce the theme. Sort of like how at the end of The Goldfinch you have like this giant speech where Donna Tartt basically like hits you in the head with a baseball bat about you know what her book's about. And I felt that C.E. Morgan did that in a little uh, minor way or maybe like instead of one place it was throughout the book there were speeches. So I felt that she could make those shorter or cut them or something. I thought it was a little too long in those places and it was like talking heads kind of deal and she was already so good. She didn't really need them, you know? It also just, I get, this isn't what the book's about, but for me personally, I really appreciated the representation of severe autoimmune disease in this book. Um, I also have a severe autoimmune disease, much like the one that Almond's mother has. And I don't talk about it a lot online just for privacy reasons and I probably won't in the future but I really appreciated how the representation was because honestly I don't really see any autoimmune disease let alone the really severe ones in literature and having that representation just made me feel like maybe someone would read this and then finally understand because autoimmune diseases like it talks about in the book how um, she's a single mom and it talks about how she falls through the gaps in the assistance system um, in the United States and how that basically um, she goes finally goes to a specialist after a long whatever um, to because her hands are hurting and she just feels really badly all the time and he says you know what I can't give you a diagnosis like we can't cure this you definitely have an autoimmune disease but we can't cure this so I can't diagnose you but we can help control your systems but she's like I don't have insurance and I can't get disability if I don't have a diagnosis and he's like well you probably couldn't get it anyway because not many people recognize autoimmune diseases like this and that really is how it is you know uh, there's not much known about them and it describes her symptoms and there's a beautiful section um, where I just had to put the book down about how uh, she felt like pain in different parts of her body was slowly taking away what made her human, what made herself, until all that was left was pain and she was no longer the person that she used to be. And that really is what it's like to have a severe autoimmune disease. It's, it was really difficult for me to read, but I think it's very important that people have a frame of reference for severe autoimmune diseases. So, you know, most people know what cancer is, but not many people really know what well, autoimmune disease is period, let alone all the different kinds and the different severities and things. So I am very happy with this and I'm super excited that it was shortlisted so more people will read about it. Yeah, so I was really impressed with that even though that isn't necessarily a huge part of the book, it's the part I connected to most personally and it was really, yeah, it was really moving just on top of everything else that she was doing. As a side note, the prologue about this of this book, I have no idea what was going on and I've heard some people really kind of confused and are unsure about what it is and I don't know what it is either. So if you know anything about the prologue or have opinions about it or any helpful information, please let me know either in the comments or send me a message on Twitter or something uh, so that we can talk about it because I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, that is The Sport of Kings. A very long review for a very long book, um, but it's definitely worth you taking a look at. My hand is dying, in case you're wondering, holding that book so long. So now we're going to talk about another book, <laughs> but thankfully much lighter, so my hand will not die. Um, this is Difficult Women by Roxane Gay, and this is her short, short story collection. And it is basically a love letter to all the amazing strong women out there. Uh, it's about difficult women, either women who society considers difficult or stubborn or women who have faced difficult situations. I read Roxane Gay's essay collection and loved Bad Feminist because it allows for an imperfect feminism. Basically, you can't do everything. Do what you can. You're going to screw up, but get back up and make a difference in your corner of the world. And I really love that. And she does take a little bit of that like into this book, but it's primarily about women and 
how amazing women are, basically, how strong they are, and how society tends to think that they are much weaker, you know, you know, the whole weaker sex thing. Yeah. Roxanne Gay just blew out that out of the water. She also shows an astounding range of versatility and sci-fi and fantasy and just everything is in this book and I never read as I said her fiction before and I was really impressed with it. Um, I can't wait to read more of her fiction. Um, I haven't read The Untamed State because of all the trigger warnings. I might try it and see what I can do. Um, this also has all of the trigger warnings, just fair warning. I felt like she did not over describe because I was worried from what I'd read that I might need to put it down but I felt like she said what happened but she didn't go in so much detail that you couldn't handle it and it still was super moving and effective and yeah I love this book I can't wait to read her memoir that's coming out this summer I hope I can go see her and get it signed and then like you know worship at the altar of Roxane Gay or something like oh my goodness she is just so wonderful and also so wonderful on Twitter yeah I think I've mentioned this before but she like live tweets stuff so she'll be watching television or the Super Bowl or, you know, debates or whatever, and she's really funny. So you'll definitely want to go check out her live commentary because, yeah, it's Roxanne Kay. And my hand is still dying. Thank you, Sport of Kings. So the last book I want to talk about actually is a book that I forgot to talk about last time, so I'm just going to put it in this one, and that is, I think it's Big Happy Mushy Lump. I might be rearranging the words, but just refer to the picture that's on the screen right now, and uh, this is... The second volume in Sarah Anderson or Sarah Scribbles's, it's hard to say, uh, webcomic. And it is a wonderful webcomic. Oh my goodness. If you are a female millennial who is like a book nerd introvert, you will love, 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 love this collection. Uh, she has everything. It's everything. And uh, she has all kinds of book comics. She has all, just everything. Everything you could want as an introvert. And they're just all so funny and she does an amazing job and she has like this cartoon uterus is probably one of my favorites because she has all of these like period jokes in comics about what it's like to be a woman and it's I know it sounds stupid I'm gonna try to include a photo of what I'm talking about here but it's just so funny because that is the way it that's the way being a woman is and I think she perfectly captures that in a really funny way and um, after I read so many intense, like, deep, depressing, moving, wonderful novels, I needed a palate cleanser, and so I read this one. But that's it for me. I'm just gonna stop now, and hopefully you can go check out these books and read them and love them as much as I have, because even though it was just three novels, they were all great, so I feel happy, but very happy about that. <laughs> anyway. Um, I guess I will talk to you later. It's been fun chatting and, uh, bye guys.